Good afternoon. We can begin the afternoon work. In the first slide, I would like to remark which are the aim of the afternoon sessions. So I should present a very easy case, an everyday case, and then each participant should present a strategy based on he or her preferred moidon technique to guide it. And it's important to remember that we should discuss everything all around the hemodynamic aspect, not in general fluids, steroids, or what you want, or whatever you want. So again, a very easy case, a discussion on it. I just leave it for one minute because everybody should be learned by, by then. OK? So is a male 79 years old, 70 kilo, 1.75 meters of height. Suffering from systemic hypertension while controlled with the drugs and chronic renal insufficiency with a creatinine of 1.8. In the story, five or almost six years before, he had a resection of rectal sigma anterior and a transvestostomy because of neoplasia. But it was more than five years ago. Then he was admitted to the hospital because he had a laparoseal and he should receive a laparoplastic repair surgery, a very small hernia of no more than 1.5 centimeters, so a very, very easy surgical procedure. <coughs> well, he has been operated on, and the day after, he's not so good. I mean, he's doing not so well, and he has some pain in no peristalsis, and the patient become oli oliguric. The security increased. Remember, it was 1.8 in pre-op evaluation, and it's tachycardic and hypotensive. So something it doesn't work. And he has an atrial fibrillation, and he's, he is really tachypnoic. I think you're so happy for the cardiologist, because he has been called by the surgeons he suddenly arrived there, and he gave him some flakenid, and he stopped the fiber atrial fibrillation. So it was a wonderful result, but the patient is still not doing well. And in the world, he had an ab injustice event during a vomiting episodes, and the surgeon put there a nasogastrin tube, of course, and there were 600 milliliters of brown material. He was really desaturated, 80% of oxygen saturation. Uh, so we were colored. Immediately was endotracheal intubated because he, were, he had no present, he had no consciousness. And he had a tachycard, ventricular tachycardia or with pulseless condition. <laughs> and of course, advanced life support was applied and with one micro or my, my milligram of adrenaline, everything was stopped. And it was admitted to ICU. As soon as arriving in ICU, a central venous catheter was inserted, and the SCV2 was 47%. A right, right other line was inserted too, and we gave you a wide spectrum antibiotic therapies, and two liter of rinder acetate plus one liter of hydroxyacetate starch. In this moment, in-out balance was 4,000 in positive, of course. We gave him some remifental, a very low dosage. Look at the dosage of remifental. We didn't know anything about the consciousness of this patient. So it was 0 0.05 mic per kilo per minute. And neuroadrenaline because of the blood pressure. And notwithstanding 0 0.5 mic per kilo per minute of neuroadrenaline, heart rate was 130, arterial pressure was 95 over 45, CVP was 12, and SCVO2 now was 60. He was ob obviously ventilated, totally ventilated. And we performed a fibrillatory bronchoscopy, in which we found the same color of the material we found in the nasogastric tube in the trachea and bronchi. It was totally anuric. And this was the 
Blood gas sample we, gave, we did in that moment, a PAFO2 ratio of 65, a PSU2 of 48, lactate 4.6, bicarbonate 12, pH 7.01, and so as you know, minus 13 of basic cells, 10 of hemoglobin, 5.46 of white red, red, red cells, and platus 175. That's all. This is the condition in this moment. I have a second part of the slide that I don't want to show you in which I show you what we did. But what you did? What you would like to do? Daniel. Tell me if you need to, to see again some slides or some parameters. It's enough. Yes, yes, it's better. So, well, I guess it's good you are in Rome because you believe in miracles, but um, in Brussels, we do not believe in miracles. So what we would have done in this case at that stage, um, because indeed um, uh, it seems that um, the surgeon has to do probably something very rapidly, uh, but uh, the patient is not really in condition to go to surgery at that stage. So uh, we will have to do something on the hemodynamic um, of course, besides antibiotics and stuff like this. So, um, obviously, you had a patient which is quite uh, old with um, chronic hypertension and so probably also um, uh, diastolic dysfunction and uh, not responding very well to, uh, to fluids and already with uh, some uh, severe respiratory um, dysfunction. So, um, it's really the um, very difficult aspect. I forgot if this patient was at that time in a, a sinus rhythm or he was still in atrial fibrillation. Before it was in the sinus rectum, and then he, he went again in sinus rectum after the cardiologist intervention. Okay, so um, so uh, I guess that um, the uh, first step, and before having the chance to uh, go and take my echo, would be to ask myself, is there still some room for giving some fluids? And so I will look at the uh, post-pressure variation, uh, if there is um, absolutely no variation, because I guess tidal volume may be low and stuff like this, then I will rapidly go and take my um, transesophageal echo and do a transesophageal echo in this patient. If I, because then I have, um, let's say, it's easy to understand that uh, probably the um, cardiac output is not adequate. You have already uh, a CV2, which was a 60, I think, uh, which is quite already uh, quite low, um, uh, even for a CV2. If a CV2 had been normal, I would maybe have guessed differently for cardiac output, but probably cardiac output is abnormal already now. And the big issue is, you know, if we have to give more fluids in this patient who already received a lot of fluids and f obviously seems not to respond very well to it, or if we have uh, to face some um, right ventricular or uh, left ventricular or both uh, dysfunction, and that may be the I mean, and or fluids should be given. So um, I think echo should be good to have. Uh, so first echo. First echo because we are in really emergency and we have to decide in uh, five minutes or ten minutes uh, what we have to do. Uh, and because of with a pH of uh, seven o o, I don't think we have a lot of time to, um, to to spend to insert other catheters and do other things. Second option. <laughs> Sure. I, you know what? I agree exactly with that. I think the first question that you have to address is uh, volemia. Uh, is there any potential benefit from further volume? And, um, you know, in the, that setting, I would start off with just a volume challenge, but I would be asking for an echo because the, the, I guess the next thing is there's very significant uh, opportunity in this patient to have myocardial dysfunction. So uh, those, are, those are the things that I would want to get done right away. Now, you're never going to fix them without source control, so simultaneously you have to be working out getting this guy to the OR, uh, you know, in, in some hemodynamically acceptable state, but it's not going to be very pretty. Uh, nevertheless, he has to get there, otherwise he's not going to get fixed. Um, you know, monitoring of a central venous sat, for example, you've got most of the information you need now. You, you ask the question, and to yeah, a large 60. extent, yeah, yeah it's, it's up at 60. And four so, liters infusion. Yeah. So, so, you know, you've got him uh, reasonably resuscitated, but it's not great. You still have very significant problems with mean arterial pressure, but I believe 
the echo is, is going to show you a fair amount of distributive shock and a significant myocardial component. So, um, yeah. Remember, he has 130 hmm. beats per minute of yep. heart rate. Yep. So in echo, in that condition, it's not so easy to give you information mm -hmm. on the function or kinetic in general. You select it like that. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and so I guess that's part of another a volume challenge, I think, is appropriate in this guy because that's, that's a reversible component that should be treated rapidly if you can. Uh, the downside, of course, is worsening oxygenation in this guy, but in the balance between what's going to kill this guy fastest right. right now, it looks more like his circulation, and therefore I would uh, start off with the volume challenge. Daniel? Uh, just a word on, on the tachycardia. Tachycardia will not be a very limiting factor for some of the things I will look at. I will look at the variation in supervena cava. Uh, the tachycardia does not have any impact on it. I will look on the uh, right or end left ventricular dilation. It will not have a huge impact. And so uh, because I will not look at the mitral inflow and stuff like this, I will not be so much impaired by the heart rate of this guy. Third option. There's uh, a lovely saying if ever you go to Ireland and ask for directions where you're likely to get the answer, uh, well, I wouldn't be starting from here, sir. <laughs> and in seriousness, I would hope never to be in this situation because long before anybody ever got a CVC line in, an art line in, I would have already uscommed them on the ward and I would already know their hemodynamics. Now, what do I suspect in this guy? Yeah, all the evidence is this guy is severely hypoxic. I'm willing to bet his DO2 is round about 600 on a good day. Total, not per square metre, total. I'm willing to bet he's probably got a vascular resistance which is very high, his stroke volume is very low. Given that he's hypoxic, he's got a long history of cardiac uh, and hypertensive disease, and we presume it's phasogenic hypertension given the renal issues, it's reasonable to assume he's going to have a very low inotropy, low cardiac output, high vascular resistance, high afterload, probably volume depleted state. Now, we could have been doing something about that in all the time that was spent taking this guy from the ward to the ICU, putting in lines, pipes, and all the rest of it. My gut feeling, for what it's worth, yes, we're going to need to have a look inside this guy's abdomen. You can't dare anaesthetize him right now. We're going to need simultaneous inotropes. Which one will be determined by the afterload? If his afterload is very high, I'd go with dobutamine or enoxamone. Well, you know, zero point five. Does he need fluid? Well, let's have a so look. Do, you, expect you, know, well, you expect to have very high resistance in this moment. Yeah, I'm sure it so is. It is. No. So now we've got to say, are we more interested right now in pressure or do we want flow? And I think you've then got to manipulate the hemodynamics fairly quickly to get that flow back, even if it's at the expense of allowing the pressure to drop, because right now he's not got enough oxygen to keep him alive and the wheels are going to fall off the wagon very soon. I'm sure that the most of the people sitting here with a, that PF, PF, FiO2 ratio and uh, with 4,000 of liters, with 4,000 milliliters infused, they take care a lot before giving more fluids. Or not? Yeah. Yes, it is. But it's, Santi doesn't agree. Well, Daniel, then Jean-Louis. Well, I mean, there are if you look at the uh, blood gas exchange, with a such a low SVO2, you should not expect for a given shunt to have a good PO2. So if you just increase the, the SVO2 by improving the blood flow tissues, yeah. you will probably improve also the uh, oxygenation of this patient. So uh, at this stage, I do not know a lot on the um, lung function of this patient. It's probably not very good, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, it's, um, uh, his hemodynamic state is really more in danger than the uh, blood gas. And um, if I have to, to bet something, I probably can say that um, if we do not do do nothing, it will die within a couple of minutes from a uh, uh, hemodynamic failure. Yeah, it will not die from respiratory failure. Yeah. So the position now is ASCOM or TEE, just to understand how the heart is working right now. That's the position so far. Jean-Louis. 
Yes, uh, I would like to have the next slide, please. No, this slide. <laughs> okay, this? this one, yes. In fact, we have uh, already a lot of information from the uh, outer pressure uh, values. And as I said yesterday, we have a low diastolic pressure in presence of a high heart rate. This can indicate if we uh, uh, trust on the values, this can indicate that vascular tone is low. Second point, we have uh, only 50 millimeters of mercury of pulse pressure, which is too low for these patients because these patients uh, suffer from a chronic hypertension. So we may, and is uh, old, 79, so we may expect a large pulse pressure for a normal stroke volume. In this case, we can uh, we can expect a low stroke volume, we can expect a low vascular tone, I disagree with you, if I trust on the, on the values, okay, or, of course. So, uh, I have the impression that we have to give more norepinephrine, for example, but also we have to push uh, cardiac output further. So, uh, very uh, rapidly I will increase norepinephrine and uh, either uh, look at the pulse pressure version is possible or to perform a passive regressing test, for example, if possible, in order to discriminate between uh, a low cardiac output from uh, volume depletion or from cardiac dysfunction. But there is a risk of, do, of giving dobutamine without any uh, echocardiography or uh, any documentation of cardiac dysfunction in this patient because of arrhythmias, a risk of arrhyth new arrhythmias and tachycardia. So your position is to is give norepinephrine and to uh, to perform echo as soon as possible. Okay, but if you do not have any echo available, to look at pulse pressurization or okay, to per perform passive aggressing to to be sure that the patient is not fully responsive. Any comment, Daniel? I'm afraid that passive gigaf grazing may be really a danger in this patient. You mentioned that you already had uh, inhalation of vomit uh, because you vomited some gastric content. Even though there were some aspirations, there is probably some bowel occlusion and a lot of stuff like this. We do not know exactly also what is the abdominal pressure. It may be elevated uh, in this patient. So um, we had a lot of things that may perhaps impair both the validity of the test because the pressure in the abdomen will impair the, uh, the result and the risk induced by the um, inhalation and other stuff like this. Another comment there? No? Yeah, just a short comment. I think Jean-Louis uh, took, took the, the point very well. But in addition, it's a class 1A recommendation. Even if you have an echo available or not, that's the duty of the hospital to provide you with diagnostic technology. That's the point. You strongly support to have an echo available in every ICU, of course. Of course yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other comment from the audience about this case or different position from the panelists or not? I, I might just add that I would be pretty concerned about um, using some of the uh, monitoring techniques that we've discussed uh, because this guy violates many of the assumptions uh, in a number of those techniques. So I would be sticking with primary data and uh, Jean-Louis I think did a good job of walking us through that. So uh, blood pressure, <coughs> adequacy of perfusion, again, I would, you know, if you have time for a PA catheter, sure, you can get a, uh, for sure, central or mixed venous sat or a well-placed uh, mixed venous sat. To me, that's primary data, and uh, an echo to me is primary data, and, and that's why I would pri prioritize it very highly, whereas uh, many of the derived things, gosh, I, I would be concerned, and I'd still go back and do those tests. On Sunday evening after the session, uh, I went for a walk in Rome and uh, aiming at the Piazza Navona and ended up totally lost. So what did I do? I bought a map. I, I think the same thing here. You cannot have too much information to help you make what's going to be a very difficult decision either way. You treat blind, you're in danger of going up a cul-de-sac. So the doctor was on call, was not so expert like Antoine for uh, ECHO, so he tried to look at the heart to the TEE. He put a probe inside, the probe inside, he watched four normal chambers. Notwithstanding the heart was so high, 
it seems to be a very normal heart. So he say, oh, what I have to do? I answered the most of your question or not. Um, it's, it's really important when you uh, use data that you understand the limitations of your data. And if this is an inadequate study, w which it sounds like it might be, uh, then you have to call in someone who can do an adequate study and they have to be there right away. Um, I, I think shooting from the hip with data that we're uncertain about could lead you, you know, into big, into big trouble. Daniel? Well, I totally agree. If these uh, data are true, this may uh, probably uh, mean uh, diastolic dysfunction much more, much more than systolic dysfunction, and probably fluids and norepinephrine will be the first uh, choice before um, getting help with a more experienced doctor to confirm um, these data. But we're just calling the, uh, the colleagues, uh, which uh, may live uh, one hour from the hospital or may take one hour to come and see the images with a pH of 7 would be a little bit too long. So we need to do something now. And uh, unfortunately, we, we have nothing better than this imprecise but perhaps correct image. I would favor uh, presumptive diagnosis. And so I will mostly act with uh, fluids and uh, norepinephrine. Bennett? Can I just ask, I'm not sure where we are in time now. How long are we, I, I can't remember how many hours have gone by to get to this stage. Do we know? 10 minutes. Yeah, it, just 10, 15 minutes, a very short time, not so long. So you had the echo done within 10 minutes? Uh, from the war to the ICU, something like 30 minutes, yeah, mm. something like that. But am I right in saying the most fundamental information you require here is what the cardiac output is? Do we agree or not to that? No, no? you don't? I disagree. No, well, okay. Finish. All right. <laughs> well, no. That's all. <laughs> no, you don't agree. No. no, I agree with you that this information is something we would like to know, but we already know it from the data we have that cardiac output is low because we have a SCU2 of 47 uh, in a patient with septic shock, the low pulse pressure, and so on and so on. So we are. The, the information is already provided. We do not know exactly ex the extent of the uh, inadequate cardiac output. It may be two liters, three liters, something like this. Uh, but uh, we already know that the problem of this patient will be a low cardiac output in the context of sepsis. Um, the answer on, on the way to treat it is a little bit more difficult. But just the cardiac output will not help us a lot. There was another comment there, yeah? Yeah, I, I'd also argue that um, I'm worried about uh, tissue oxygenation uh, and, and organ function, the derived organ function. So that's the thing that I want evidence that I've uh, adequately resuscitated. The cardiac output number itself, um, you know, so the number is five. Is that good or bad? I mean, it, until you have an assessment of adequacy of tissue perfusion, I don't think you've addressed the, the problem. So that's why I was disagreeing. <clears throat> Comment, yeah, yeah. I'll just split the panel and say I would pay a lot of attention to the cardiac output because that's what determines your DO2 and your DO2 keeps you alive. So um, I think you can't ignore it. So we have two positions. We want to know but, or we don't want well, to know cardiac output? Well, we, we know that this patient does not have an adequate DO2. We have already SCV2 of 47. But in remember the, the, the in context the two ratio it was very low. So the, it's strong. Never mind. I mean, the, the, uh, the critical DO2 or PO2 is close to be reached because uh, with the SCV2 of 47, this means... That became 60. Okay, but the, um, this is the uh, SCV2, so the SV2 should be a 10 or something like this lower. You have a lactate of a 5 or 6, you have a pH of 7. I don't know if you can really have uh, an adequate DO2 with this, so um, you have no chance of having an adequate DO2. So we know that DO2 is inadequate without any measurement of DO2. Uh. Another comment? I, I totally agree with the comments made by Jean-Louis. I think the question that we have to ask now is, is the fluid resuscitation sufficient for this patient or not? And if I have an echo in the ICU and I have a look to the four chambers, I also have a look to be in a cabin theory. And so, uh, and then have very fast the answer where this patient is sufficiently fluid resuscitated. And the next question is, cardiac contractility normal or not? And these are the two questions I have. 
Okay. Maybe with the echo, I have those information. Of course. Definitely. Yeah, the, the echo seems to be normal, but we don't know any information yeah. about the inferior vena cava. But it has a heart yeah. rate of 130, as you yeah, said. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Another comment um, was another hand. Can, I'll, I'll just comment on uh, a normal echo. Uh, any an echo that's read normal in this situation is wildly abnormal. Uh, because you, you look at a heart rate of 130, uh, you shouldn't see a normal looking chamber size or contractility. Absolutely. And when your mean arterial pressure is as low as that is, um, you should see a dramatically increased uh, ejection fraction. And when you're on uh, an adrenergic agent like noradrenaline, you should have uh, incredible contractility. So the combination of things, if this was a normal heart, it would almost be cavity obliterating, and it wasn't. So we already know there's a degree of myocardial dysfunction. Yes, we know that there is some myocardial dysfunction. The problem is to know to which extent this myocardial dysfunction is the primary determinant of the shock of this patient. Because indeed, it is not a very low ejection fraction. It's, no, it's not a dilation of the right ventricle compressing the, the ventricle. So um, uh, if we had to use one single therapy, we have to focus on the primary determinant. And of course, we know that there will be a mixture. There will be a mixture of vasoplegia. This is a patient with septic shock. We will have the problem of uh, some cardiac dysfunction. This is a patient with previous uh, heart disease uh, and uh, with problems probably have myocardial dysfunction and sepsis. The issue is I have to give some drugs. I have to choose between uh, an inotrope, a vasopressor, and uh, fluids. And all these drugs may have some drawbacks in such a situation. So we have to, to choose the best one to begin with, or maybe a combination of two. But it would be very difficult to put both dobutamine, 5 micrograms, norepinephrine to raise blood pressure, and fluids. We may do it. I mean, but it's probably better to have a, a, a little bit of escalation and to, to, to select the first and more likely interventions that will improve the situation. Meanwhile, a picocatheter was inserted and he had 3.9 liter per minute of cardiac index, okay. exavascular weather of 7, and intertracial blood volume of 820. Another comment. Just to close, the, because it's 30 minutes, we have to finish. Yes. So Please. this actually is, is one of the, this gets to my question, I guess, which is if you're, if you're choosing between a monitoring strategy and you're picking echo versus one of the other hemodynamic tools that we've talked about for the last day, if you had had this information where you've got some estimate of cardiac function and in diastolic volume or volumetric parameters of preload, does that obviate the need? Do you no longer need an echo or do you still need the echo and, in, and I guess in what circumstances, how do those complement each other because it seems like they're providing similar information at least. Okay. Closing remark. Another there. Just, just a quickie. I may have missed it, but what was this patient's hemoglobin level? Ten. Ten. Well, that cardiac index is not that high when you consider that hemoglobin. And 130 of heart rate. Mm -hmm. So the stroke yeah. volume is very low. So again, you work out the DO2, it's, uh, it's not sky high. This is not galloping sepsis. Not yet. <laughs> At the beginning. It's the it's, beginning. A it's comment not, there? It's very high cardiac output. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different galloping. thing. Uh, the, the high cardiac output, the galloping cardiac output is, I guess, we're galloping because we're so happy because it's the survivors that have the ki high cardiac output, uh, you know, kind of what we call the classic picture. This is the picture of the non-survivor with the, the low cardiac output state. Um, uh, to answer Dr. Martin, I, you know what, it still doesn't take away for me the need uh, for an echo because I need to understand what's happening with the heart. and. I actually do need a little bit uh, better assessment of volemia. I guess I could keep going with volume challenges, but uh, you know, an echo is going to be a wonderful endpoint, and I need it anyway to look at cardiac function. So this this didn't actually this data, uh, as interesting as it is, didn't change anything for me. Um, to very f short comment, just to close the session. Yes. Concerning the problem of cardiac output, I, I would just uh, like to stress that cardiac output um, look, looks normal or something like that. But in fact, stroll volume is low because the heart rate is uh, very high. Yeah, right, yeah. So uh, this, uh, this uh, confirmed what uh, Antoine said uh, just before, uh, to look at the stroke volume, and stroke volume is low. It is responsible for low pulse pressure in this, uh, in this particular patient. So it was uh, the point I, would, I, would, uh, I wanted to stress. The last comment? I, I'm missing two values that PICO shows you, is cardiac function index and global ejection fraction. 
if I look to these two values, I have an idea more or less whether my myocardial function is more or less Look preserved. at the hand of uh, Azril. <laughs> <laughs> Your hand was like that. What does it mean? Do you think it's enough or not for this patient? I was not in Okay, don't worry. <laughs> go, go ahead. Look to us. I'm afraid that if you compute the cardiac function with the cardiac index of 4 and um, ITBV of um, 800, it will be uh, normal. And the cardiac function is not normal in this patient. So I think this is really a limitation of numbers. Just because you compute numbers on the um, cardiac output and not the numbers on stroke volume. If you have the same uh, discussion on stroke volume, you may indeed end up with a, a poor function. Because you just compensate with tachycardia. How the guy do? Okay. <laughs> I, I think we have to close it. It's <laughs> two, it's 30, more than 30 minutes. John Louis, we have to move to the next section. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope the patient did well. Tell us. Uh, yes. If you want a, a close, room? very, I mean, <laughs> briefly. So we tried to awake the patient, the cautions was conserved. So it was awakened, and remifentanil was continued as a sedation therapy. Then, he, was, he, he received two more liters of fluids, so it was plus six liters because ITB was only 800 and the stroke volume was very low. And look at the condition soon after in which ATB increased, exovascular was increased, you can remember of Abingesis events, and noradrenaline was decreased of 50%, and SCVO2 was still 58. PF2 was just a little bit increased, 100 and the ventilation was changing in a BPAP mod modulation. And then, it was still a neuric, ketamine was still high, in beginning furosemide infusion, antibiotics, the lactate decreased, hemoglobin was still, oh, excuse me, was still high. Finally, the patient was operated on, and it was four, six hours later, our ICU admission, Finally, toilet was done, so the source control was there, was done again. And, and uh, again, the cushion was conserved. It's gone down, yeah. We are two days after the operation. The uris is restored, 1.5 milliliter per kilo per hour. We gave some phenoldamide just to delight the kidney. Again, antibiotics, lactate decreased, the hemoglobin was still constant, and then we changed it to sufentanil for the long-term infusion for sedation. Heart rate decreased, and he began doing well, but it, was, it has a very long history, and PA2 of P2 was still low. The uresis was the same. We are at the third post-op day. Lactate was two. We use C activated protein because they had all the inclusion criteria to use it, and we gave hydrocortisone, and then CVVH until the fourth day because it dropped down severely. We stopped adrenaline in the fifth day, and percutaneous tracheostomy on 11 P ICU day admission. New laparotomy because, you know, surgeons are always the same. They don't do the best they can in the first, not in the second, but the third time. <laughs> and finally, after one month or more of ICU, it was discharged to the world, but he, he did well. Okay, I thank you. Thank you.